Hello and uh, good afternoon, my dear colleagues and friends in the uh, UAE, Dubai. I'm talking to you today from uh, our hospital, which is in the southeastern part of Germany in the Alps. And as you can see on this picture, snow has melted. We're waiting spring and hopefully that the virus will leave all of us that we might have a chance to visit each other soon in this year. I was given the honor to present on multiple sclerosis pathophysiology update of 2021, which is rather new here, but interesting things are coming, which does definitely have an impact on how we view the disease process itself and how we best could interfere with that for the benefit of our patients. This is just my disclosures. I would like to start with a slide which probably some of you know in one or the other thing and the most important aspects we're currently looking at is probably that we view multiple sclerosis pathophysiology as a continuum but a continuum over decades of life so it's very difficult to shrink all of this within you know a short period which we currently very often use in animal models but definitely with advanced technology, we have seen that what is listed here really also happened in our patients. Initially, in the part of the relapsing form of multiple sclerosis, inflammation heralds the process, which clinically can result in conduction block, which we can measure with evoked potentials, demyelination or axonal injury. But the most important thing, which clearly shows up as the clinical picture, are repeated attacks driven by a systemic immune system more adaptive than innate immunity. And I will come to this difference later when I go in the various parts in detail. And it's interesting and known for years that remyelination and compensation does occur to various extents and may mask the damage which will later on appear like some kind of degeneration, which is listed here on the right-hand side, where loss of axons by continuous infliction of inflammatory attacks, neurons which fail um, remyelination, the innate immunity which takes over, particularly in a compartmentalized inflammation beyond a closed blood-brain barrier, where we know that, for example, activated microglia plays an important process to orchestrate the um, closed uh, inflammatory process. Therefore, the clinical disease activity is less overt and it will more show up in continuous loss of function as we can see it in secondary progressive MS and also in primary progressive MS, where we have difficulty to detect um, clinical overt aspects of inflammation. The depleted repair and compensation capacity associated with comorbidities and aging is probably what makes up what we see as the progression of the disease. And that usually takes place over a 30 to 50 year course of the overall evolution. As we stand right now, we know inflammation is something we can tackle quite a bit with various disease modifying treatments and the process of degeneration or the um, depleted repair and compensation strategies. That's something that we're looking for future treatments. And with some interesting aspects of what we know already since the early clinical description of MS, as in history has shown us that the old pathologists and even Charcot did know already about uh, the um, inflammatory white matter lesion and his um, discipline, um, Joseph Babinski has clearly shown this as well, as you can see on the left side. And we know already for over hundred years that there is inflammation around small vessels. And if you look down, the picture has become more complete or to some extent also confusing as we know more about the different parts of the immune system which orchestrates this process finally leading to demyelination and axonal damage. What is interesting that we do have now more and more opportunities to look in the process also dynamically 
And we know that there are different fates of lesions once they occur, either in the white or in the gray matter. Active lesion can turn into inactive lesion and might even disappear. We know that some lesions do remyelinate and thereby also shrink. But we also know that chronic active slowly expanding lesion, which could be probably major part of the progressive stage of the disease, can evolve over years as listed down here in the scale. But also these chronic active lesions, once they also become enhancing lesions, may have some remyelinating capacity. And what is interesting uh, that from the classical immunohistology, which you can see here on the left hand part, where we know that the slowly expanding lesion, for example, are associated with myelin loss and with a high impact of activated myoglobin in the um, surrounding of that lesion. And that is usually filled up with iron. And iron loaded microglia can be depicted in vivo at high Tesla MRI. So here for the first time, seven Tesla MRI serial scans over seven years has shown us that an expanding lesion, as it is shown here with the periventrica lesion in this patient, are around the hypo um, uh, intense iron rim microglia, which is expanding over years. Here you can see the 3.5 years follow up. And that is an interesting aspect of the chronic activity, which we see more often in progressive phases of the disease. And that has been evaluated serially, longitudinally in 33 MS patients. And there's a clear cut correlation between lesions which shrink over time because they are not loaded with um, activated microglia around them or the ones which do uh, increase in size over time, which are the ones which are um, called the iron loading um, rim-like lesions, which is now clearly depicted as an important aspect of the progressive pathology. Interesting that for the first time, what we have seen from a lot of histology analysis can now be viewed with 70 MRI over a um, couple of years and showing that this is a chronic expanding process. And the immune cells, which from the systemic immunological footprint, which confers the autoimmune attack into the central nervous system are associated with the slowly expanding lesion, consists mainly of CD8 cytotoxic uh, T cells and also over the long period of time with CD20 proliferating B cells, which can end up into plasma cells as it is shown down here in the histopathology. So again, what we know from uh, in vitro studies and in classical histological stainings, we can now also view this process is clearly happening if we look at serial uh, seven Tesla MRI. A clear cut aspect about what triggers the autoimmune process is also becoming clearer now. For a long period of time, we know that this is a combination of endogenous uh, genetic aspects of the disease. And we know more than 250 uh, SNPs now associated mainly with the immune system, which confer some genetic susceptibility and environmental aspects, which can then drive this autoimmune process, which is present in many individuals, but only if the combination of an external factor by a propensity of the immune system to prevail autoimmune attacks really makes up a clinical disease. And I would like to focus on two aspects which become more and more important in if we look at the environmental aspect. The one thing is about our diet and what the gut microbiota makes out of that. And the other one is the aspect of smoking, where we have seen a lot of um, important clinical um, uh, aspects, how that can influence the disease 
process. We know, for example, that just the odds ratio of smokers to become MS is about 1.6. But as there is an interaction for some of this um, environmental factor with the genetic predisposition, we can see that the highest uh, impact of a combined um, odds ratio of non-genetic factor and the HLA allele is in smoking, which comes up then all of a sudden to an odds ratio of 14, or with EBV seropositivity. And in addition to that, also quite interesting adolescent obesity uh, within BMI over 27 at the age of 20 is also highly associated with that. So two external factors combined with an internal genetic predisposition can really trigger the autoimmune process to quite an important aspect. And we also know that there is evidence for that from clinical studies. For example, how can smoking cause multiple sclerosis? Uh, Thomas Olson, a very nice review in 2070 has already alluded to that. We know that smoking itself does cause a pro-inflammatory constitution of the lung uh, tissue, but it also interferes with the um, antigen presenting cells in the blood as it transfers into the blood the contents of the uh, various components of smoke can induce a bystander activation of an already autoimmune triggered immune cell. And by that, you can see that it does have a direct influence on the propensity of autoimmune cells turning into autoaggressive cells and by that being able to transmigrate through the blood brain barrier into the CNS and cause a new lesion. The other aspect, which is quite amenable also for therapeutic approaches, is what's going on in our gut. We know for more than 10 years now that there is quite an ecologic niche or homeostasis, which we should try to maintain of various bacteria in the different parts of our intestines, which does have a major impact on the gut associated immune system. And it also has a major impact on um, the uh, evidence of uh, factors going across uh, this continuous barrier with the outside world, and thereby also shaping the immune system. And even though we don't know whether a single uh, microbiota responsible for that, but it has clearly been shown that, for example, here on the left-hand side um, by the group around uh, Hartmut Becker in a very interesting and uh, Reinhard Hohlfeld, um, a genetic study that the uh, uh, monozygotic twins, which differ by their appearance of multiple sclerosis, also differ in the propensity of the gut microbiota to induce disease in susceptible animals. So there is something in this composition which makes up our um, immune system in a way that it either silence autoimmune events or can induce autoaggressive autoimmunity, which is so much associated with the inflammatory attacks in multiple sclerosis. And the interesting aspect about that, which has come up with new approaches to therapy, is that modification in our diet does have a major impact on our microbiome something which we know also from other autoimmune diseases, for example, type one diabetes, but also for the, um, the modification of the immune reaction in multiple sclerosis, this has become an important and interesting target. For example, the indigestible carbohydrates, which can be chopped up by the commensal gut bacteria and very smaller pieces, and also the short chain fatty acids about that does have, for example, an important impact on the tolerogenic um, dendritic cells in terms of inducing regulatory T cells. And the group of uh, Ralph Gold and Ralph Linker uh, in last year's publication in Cell 
has basically summarized what they have already worked on for a couple of years, that uh, one of these short um, chain fatty acids, propionic acid, shapes the immune system in a way uh, that it is inducing regulatory T cells, increasing the metabolism and function of them, thereby inducing IL-10, and thereby directly having an impact of the reduction of inflammatory activity in the central nervous system. And as they has elegantly shown in a small clinical trial, even increasing the subcortical gray matter and thereby also reducing disease progression. So this is just a breakdown of what our microbiome does with indigestible carbohydrates. But it clearly shows us that through components which are produced in our uh, intestine, we can shape the immune system in MS patients in a beneficial way. And a larger scale clinical trial is now on its way and we are awaiting these results, combining what we have known about the gut microbiota and the potential using this knowledge for treating multiple sclerosis as you might anticipate is also a small uh, lipophilic agent, which is able to penetrate the blood brain barrier and thereby also having directly effects there. If we now look beyond the reduction of inflammation, because we have achieved quite a bit with various modern types of therapy, we can induce and in state where there is no evidence of disease activity anymore, detected clinical or MRI evaluation, and thereby we come to a silencing of this autoaggressive attack in the central nervous system. And even to some stage has already been shown that neuroprotective autoimmunity can be induced. And we can now view the potential of interfering with the central nervous processes, which are impaired by inflammation in a beneficial way if that is reduced. And one interesting, very roughly examined example is that the inflammatory attack inside the central nervous system has a direct effect on synaptic plasticity by interfering, for example, with the um, uh, post-synaptic composition of various um, uh, neurotransmitter uh, receptors. And by reducing this activated microglia, we can also reinstall a more physiological synaptic interaction and thereby improving the synaptic and also neuroplasticity in general in the central nervous system. Another important aspect, what we have learned over the last few years is a new view on remyelination in MS brains. We know more about the factors which impair a successful remyelination. We know that even resident oligodendrocytes are, can be induced to remyelinate. And we know that oligodendrocyte precursor cells, which do occur in um, uh, le uh, certain remyelinating lesions, can be induced to, uh, on the one hand, proliferate, uh, migrate, and differentiate into actively remyelinating agents if we focus particularly on astrocyte and microglial factors, which are um, and two different aspects interfering with this process. On the one hand, we know that it's important to clear the debris to make the axon free for the remyelinating attempt. And then we have to focus on the factors which can be released and driven a regenerating process in the central nervous system. Um, if the microglia is activated in the proper way. And if the recruitment and differentiation of oligodendrocyte precursor cells does occur, then generation of new myelin can um, be fostered. If in addition to that, modulation of the extracellular matrix and inhibitory factors can be cleared. And the knowledge about that has accumulated not only from experimental models and histopathology study, but to more extent now also with an approach of remyelination as a achievable target for our next generation approach to therapy. 
the uh, late um, uh, 2020 Lancet Neurology article from um, Catherine Lubetsky's group has nicely summarized how we have gone from the detection of premyelinating oligodendrocytes in chronic demyelinating MS lesions in the um, uh, New England Journal paper of 2002, to now a very nice approach of looking at various known um, pharmacologic compounds for the probability to induce either the um, uh, transformation and proliferation of oligodendrocyte precursor cells and the differentiation and wrapping around um, uh, axons in a um, uh, large scale approach, it was seen that certain factors which are being used for different indications and some of them even multiple sclerosis, for example, like the bladder control oxybutynin drug, that they clearly can induce remyelination in these assays. And the next step, of course, was to bring this into clinical trials. Different aspects are along the monoclonal antibodies against endogenous retrovirus or what we have seen with antilingo, for example, were attempts to uh, induce remyelination in uh, vivo in patients who were given this medication. But it clearly also showed up that in this trial, we are still looking for the important outcome parameter. Of course, these trials need to be uh, looked upon uh, reproducible results which come close to um, the aspects of remyelination vivo. And here, for example, evoke potentials. If you remember the effect, for example, of, of opicinumab on the visual evoke potentials has been shown, but the clinical outcome parameter, which was more focused on what we know from inflammatory aspects of the disease, didn't come out uh, with a positive result. Interesting, some very small compound, which you can see here on this um, in vitro staining, uh, in vitro assay, was highly in the range of differentiation and wrapping, as well as proliferation. Um, clemastine, which is an old antihistaminic uh, drug, actually could induce the reduction in the VAP latency. And that was just shown in a small trial already published in 2017. And currently two further trials are on its way on a larger scale, because in this crossover trial where the, the one group of patients received um, um, the medication in the initial part of the study and had a clear reduction in the VEP latency by a couple of milliseconds and the, then switched to placebo where it stayed there and the uh, other group received it later and also could show an effect. And again, it's a small compound listed up here, highly lipophilic, thereby able to enter the central nervous system. And um, just as a small example, we all know that we can focus on our ability to look at the um, visual system, the color vision, which is uh, clearly an indication to be affected by chronic optic neuritis. And every one of you have difficulty to see the number two on uh, this uh, initial Shihara played and probably could seek the attendance of a neurologist. But we have gone a little further and trying to use something which has already been established in um, the field of glaucoma research, a visual stimulation, high frequency color stimulation, which we could see in a small study by just using the device of an um, cell phone on which this could be held in front of the eye and thereby inducing um, the stimulation in a way that is shown here in the small video. So everyone who has epilepsy or uh, color triggered migraine, please stop watching. The other ones can see. This is uh, the device we have developed and used in a couple of patients with chronic optic neuritis. Um, and if this is applied twice a day, you can see the results here. This is just the comparison between the color um, contrast sensitivity in normals in a mass patient is slightly uh, increased. Um, that means that they need higher threshold. 
And you can see before and after the stimulation, there are short-term effects. But interestingly, in this pilot study of 6 MS patients, we even see long-term effects for a longer periods of time that's maintained with just two uh, twice-daily application of this small uh, color vision stimulation. So another approach to uh, induce impulse propagation, and uh, there are probably also inducing the aspects of remyelination. So with that, I have shown you uh, two aspects of uh, the current pathophysiology, how it has helped us in becoming more um, active approaching new therapies, not only for the inflammatory aspect of the disease, but also fostering the regeneration and uh, plasticity within the central nervous system. But just one more thing which came up recently and is uh, highly associated with what we are trying to currently to achieve to kick out the virus with the new vaccines, particularly the MRI vaccine. But it's interesting to know that the company in Germany, BioNTech, who has um, produced this initial vaccine is actually working on totally different avenues uh, before they have focused on this virus just a year ago. They are trying to find uh, non-inflammatory MRI vaccines to treat um, autoimmune disease. And just um, uh, earlier this month, it has um, been published this uh, interesting approach um, with um, an animal model where <clears throat> with the specific silencing of mock um, specific immune cells in uh, these animals, it does induce also a more broad spectrum um, bystander immunosuppression that it makes it interesting also for the application in humans and clinical trial protocols are currently being written up. And so the approach of mRNA vaccines might be also beneficial for MS patients in the future. By the ability of systemically delivering this modified mRNA by inducing non-inflammatory antigen presentation, which results in high levels of antigen-specific regulatory T cells and inducing bystander <clears throat> immune suppression, which improve disease by cognate and non-cognate autoantigens. So with that, I would like to conclude my talk by looking again at the pathophysiological targets of treatment strategy in MS which in relapsing emitting, where we have seen a lot of new medication, uh, reducing the waves of inflammation, reducing uh, transmigration across the blood brain barrier and reducing appearance and um, expansion of new lesions. The aspects which we are focusing on right now, diffuse injury, cortical demyelination, slow expansion of pre-existing lesion and the problem with compartmentalized uh, inflammation is probably um, something what we're currently looking at at future aspects and the age-related neurodegeneration, iron-related neurotoxicity and the vascular comorbidities is really something which need to be looked upon in two different aspects in order to successfully also entail uh, these aspects of the disease. In summary, Continuous process of inflammation and degeneration over decades with different modulators is the herald of the pathophysiology of MS. In vivo pathology with 07 Tesla MRI demonstrates association of activated microglia with expanding lesions and the modification by our lifestyle, by smoking or by how to treat our gut microbiota modulates the autoimmune process with a particular focus on one aspect, the propionic acid, which I've shown you, which is um, uh, an interesting new compound in the treatment era. And innovative strategies for remyelination MS offer clinical application in combination with immunotherapy and the induction of antigen-specific tolerance via mRNA vaccines associated with bystander immunosuppression is another interesting new tool in order to tackle the aspects of pathophysiology in multiple sclerosis. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and wish you all the best. Stay healthy and hope to see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>